On they go through private pain, living fear to fear. Laughter hides their silent cry. Only Jesus cares. People need. Father, we thank you for this great privilege in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Tonight, my message is entitled, The Missionary Call. So, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 5, and we read one scripture, and then we'll, be, we'll have a basis for what we are going to talk about. Amen. Hebrews chapter 5. It says, no one takes this honor to himself. Amen. 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 But receives it when he is called by God. Amen. Even as Aaron was. Amen. Amen. So to be called by God is an honor. Right. And no one can take this honor on himself. Are you listening? Yes. 
It's something you cannot take and should not take on yourself, but it's something that comes when God calls you. Amen. So I want to just basically share one of these uh, old um, great men of God, what they wrote about missionary work. Amen. All right? And so I'm just going to basically share with you because you cannot get such books. They don't sell them anymore. All right? Because people don't like such things. But I like such things, so I'm going to share. He says, what constitutes a call? Is there any way of knowing the will of God? How can one be sure? I think there is. In fact, I am certain. God would not leave his servants in darkness. Let me give you James Gilmore's experience. It is well worth quoting. And this is how he puts it. James Gilmore was a famous missionary to, um, to I think, Mongolia. All right. Now he says, he was called to the Mongols. This is how he puts it. He says, is the kingdom a harvest field? Then I thought it reasonable that I should seek to work where the work was most abundant and the workers fewest. You understand? The question is, is the kingdom of God a field? Then I would like to work where, the, in the section of the field, where the workers are few. And then the work is a lot. Does it not make sense? Yeah. Laborers say they are overtaxed at home. But what then must be the case abroad? Where there are wide stretching plains already white to harvest and scarcely here and there a solitary reaper. To me, the so this is, you see, this is the reasoning of somebody who gave himself to be a great missionary to the Mongols. Do you know Mongol in medicine? What do you call a Mongol? Mongolism. Is it because of how they look? Do they look like Mongols? Mongols? They have slanted eyes? Yeah, so there were people like that, but somebody felt it was worth going to, on such a mission. Amen. Amen. He says to me, and this is how he was reasoning. This is James Gilmore. To me, the soul of an Indian seemed as precious as the soul of an Englishman. And the gospel as much for the Chinese as for the European. And as the band of missionaries was few, compared with the company of ministers at home, it seemed to me clearly to be my duty to go abroad. But I go out as a missionary, not that I may follow the dictates of common sense, but that I may obey that command of Christ, go ye into all the world and preach. This command seems to me to be strictly a missionary injunction, so that apart altogether from choice and other lower reasons, my going forth is a matter of obedience to a plain command. And in place of seeking to assign a reason for going abroad, I would prefer to say that I have failed to discover any reason why I should stay at home. I have failed to discover any reason why I should stay at home. Gilmore went in response to the Great Commission. His captain ordered him to go and he went. And he went because he could find no adequate reason for staying at home. He went to the foreign mission field, as he says, because there, are, there the workers were fewest. What a heroic decision. What was C.T. Studd's reason for going? He went to China as a missionary. Studd, you remember, gave away a fortune of 145,000 U.S. dollars. He could have lived at home in great luxury, but he chose rather to give away all that he had and go to China as a missionary. Why? 
Why did CT Start go? I've shared with you why James Gilmore went to Mongolia. Now I'm sharing with you why CT Start. Now CT Start went because of an atheist. What an atheist said. An atheist is somebody who does not believe in God, that God exists. Strange as it may seem, it was the statement of an atheist that started him on his way. It so gripped him when he read it that he felt he must leave all and follow Jesus Christ. Here is the statement of the atheist. This is what an, 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 a, a, a person who doesn't believe in God. This is what he says. He says, Did I firmly believe, as millions say they do, that the knowledge and practice of religion in this life influences destiny in another? Then religion would mean everything to me. You, you, you get that? I say it again. Did I firmly believe? He doesn't believe, as if I were to firmly believe, as millions say they do, that the knowledge and practice of religion in this life influences another life. Then, if that was the case, I would, religion would mean everything to me. He says, I would cast away earthly enjoyment as dross. I would cast away earthly cares as follies. And earthly thoughts and feelings as vanity. Religion would be my first waking thought. And my last image before sleep sank me into unconsciousness. I would labor in its cause alone. If, if, if there was another world. And I as somebody who doesn't believe in God. I would labor only for religion. Only. I would take thought for the morrow of eternity alone. I would esteem one soul gained for heaven worth a life of suffering. Earthly consequences should never stay my hand nor seal my lips. Earth, its joys and its griefs would occupy no moment in my thoughts. I would strive to look upon eternity alone. And on the immortal souls around me, soon to be everlastingly happy or everlastingly miserable. I would go forth to the world and preach to it in season and out of season. And my text, there's the unbeliever who doesn't believe in God. My text would be, what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his soul? The preaching text will be what shall it profit a man if he should gain the whole world and lose his soul. This, it was an atheist. Someone who doesn't believe that there is God. He wrote this. He said, if, if, if religion was true, I would give myself only to religion. Because what I do in this world will affect the other world. And then that's what I would do. Is that the way you feel? Have you too felt the edge? Does the word of God burn in your heart? That means, of course, that you need the call. Men are dying. You have the message of life. Are you going to withhold it from them? I'm not, no more. This is not the atheist. I've moved on. The responsibility rests on you. And yet, the need of itself is not sufficient. There must be the ability to meet that need. If you are a missionary. Do you feel that you have the necessary qualifications? For instance, is there a language to be learned? Can you learn it? Are you young enough or is it already too late? There is your health to be considered. Have you a physique able to endure a tropical climate? Then too, a fair amount of education is imperative. Education both secular and theological. Do you qualify? It's a missionary call. My topic is the missionary call. And by Oswald J. Sanders. Hmm. Providential circumstances will prove a real factor in guidance. Doors will miraculously open and your every need will be supplied. 
Funds either earned or given for your training will be forthcoming. Obstacles and hindrances will be overcome or taken away. At the last board of God's choice will accept you. Then you will get out your outfit and your passage money and if necessary, the promise of your first year's support. First year's support. Support for one year. Yeah. Support for one year. If, 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 if by the grace of God you may get support for one year and your passage, that means your transportation to the place and support for one year. Oswell J. Sanders. To me, the call is that divine edge, the compelling impulse, that passion within that makes it impossible for me to resist. There is something within that is calling, ever calling. I am restless. I am like a hunter's dog on the leash, straining to get away. It is that irresistible must. The divine fire burns within my heart. I rise from my desk, praying to God. My mind is not on what I'm doing. I see the distant fields. I feel that come what may, I have no choice but to go. I am not satisfied to settle down where I am. One time I expressed it like this. Hark, it is a voice that calls me out of the depths of mystery. It was that inner voice that spoke to my soul and called me into the ministry, to the mission fields of the world. I can't explain it except to speak of it as an edge that was with me night and day. That edge I followed and I have never been disappointed. Let no one imagine that there is any romance in missionary work. Listen. Nor, for that matter, in traveling to foreign lands. There's no romance. There is nothing in the world so monotonous as sightseeing. My heart comes off to the man who lives in the tropics when he might remain at home. Day after day, week out and week in, month by month, the hot burning sun, a heat that takes away vitality and saps the very life and robs one of energy and all the desire for exertion and work. An atmosphere of smallpox, leprosy, typhoid, dysentery, and malaria, death and filth indescribable, loneliness unspeakable, and food mostly foreign. to think that missionary work is a joke. Being sent to the tropics is not a joke. <laughs> there is no romance. There is nothing so monotonous as sightseeing. Day after day, week out and week in, man by man, the hot burning sun, a heat that takes away vitality, it saps the very life. Is it not true? It robs one of energy and all the desire for exertion and work. An atmosphere of smallpox, leprosy, typhoid, dysentery, that is running stomach, malaria, death, filth, indescribable filth, loneliness unspeakable, and food, mostly foreign, foreign food. No, 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 my friend. If you plan to be a missionary, make sure, very, very sure that you have been called by God. Otherwise, it will be nothing short of a living death. Nothing short of a living death. The romance will wear off in a few days. Sightseeing will quickly lose its attraction and the novelty of traveling in foreign lands will become stale and you will soon find yourself utterly at sea discouragement disappointment will be your portion 
and death will be preferable to life. I'm talking about being sent on missions to Seshiyosu, to Wale Wale, to Dawadawa number four. Oh, how you will long for a change of climate, for the frost and the snow, the spring and the fall, showers of refreshing rain, instead of the endless monotony of the tropics. That tongue in the mixed climate that imparts buoyancy. And to use a slang expression, pep. Hmm. Listlessness is the order of the day. But if you have been truly called of God, if you have counted the cost, and if you are prepared to sacrifice all, if you are not deceived by the so-called glamour of the Orient, falsely so-called by tourist agencies, and if you know how to pray, then your work, then your work will be your compensation and his will will be your reward. You will be satisfied, fully and completely satisfied for you will realize that you have obeyed his voice and that all is well. In divine guidance, we walk by faith and not by sight. We only take one step at a time. In fact, we see only one step at a time. God does not reveal all the future at once. He unfolds his plan step by step. You can never know the details in advance, but you can take the next step and the next. I did not know when he took me away. He took away the work that meant everything to me, that he would give me something better. I had to walk in the dark alone with God. This is time, the time to trust. Trust when you cannot see. Say with Job, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. And mean it too. Your disappointments will become his appointments for you. He will not fail you if you but trust. Thus you will come to know his will. He will make it plain. If you are to enter the ministry and preach his gospel at home, he will show you. If you are to go to the foreign field, he will reveal it to you. If you are to go into business, marry and settle down at home to serve him here or to give him full-time service elsewhere, he will make it known to you. It was in Riga, one of the great seaports of the Russian Empire. A young man sat at an office desk in a large business building with a pencil in his hand. His eyes running up and down columns of figures. That afternoon, shadows were lengthening and the day's work was drawing to a close. The young man was worried. The expression on his face betrayed the fact that something of an unusual nature was bothering him. Some, for some reason... The figures, the calculations he was doing, refused to total correctly. <laughs> Two or three times, he lifted his head and stared restlessly as he glanced out of the window. At last, throwing down his pencil, he got up and walked to the window and he stood gazing out on the street. Russian and Lettish workmen were trudging towards their home. Basil Malov. That was his name. One of the great pastors sent as a missionary to Latvia. Yeah. The young man turned to see who had spoken, but saw no one. His face was a study as he again turned to the window to watch the busy street. Basil Malov. Again, he turned quickly, but saw nothing. The office staff appeared unconcerned. No one looked up. The more he focused his attention on the passing traffic in the street, it seemed as if a voice were repeatedly saying to him, Basil Malov, listen, if you were not in this office, helping to make a rich, unconverted manufacturer richer, richer, You are helping to make a rich, unconverted manufacturer richer still. You could go into the streets to tell others of Christ. Your employer can easily find other unconverted young men to do your work here as well as you. But if 
few who have been saved will not go. No one can take your place. Basil Malov. Frightened by this voice, Basil tried to brush it aside. No, he said, I cannot be a missionary. I have no gift of preaching. I cannot go. And he went back to his desk. A day or two later, the same voice within him spoke again. And he was forced to get up from his chair and look out of the window. Hundreds of people were passing by. Workmen in their factory blouses, black with smoke. Women with napkins, riding their vehicles. That it might be to his own imagination, he turned and resumed his work. Two times two makes four. Eight times seven are 56. Seven from 12 leaves five. Nine and three are, let me see, nine. And no one to take your place. Oh, what am I doing? You see, he was thinking seven times three. Two times four. And then the word will come, no one to take your place. No one to take your place. Whatever ails me. Again, he stole from his desk to the window and watched once more the throngs that seemed to pass along the street. Basil Malov! Basil Malov! The voice said once more, Basil, do you see those hungry multitudes? Yes, he saw them. His vision was now penetrating further and further. All of Latvia was spread before him. Russia with its teeming millions loomed up in a moment of time. Moscow, St. Petersburg appeared quickly. Moscow is its famous Kremlin at the center and 1,600 Greek Catholic churches. Then Siberia. Yes, he saw them. He saw them all in one brief moment as the vision passed before him. Basil Malov pleaded the voice within his soul. If you don't go, no one will. I have no other. There are many who can do your work here, but none can do the one over there. Basil Malov was a man of quick action. In a moment, his, vo- his mind was made up. The voice could not be ignored. The call, the call had been too clear for hesitancy. He would not be disobedient to the heavenly vision. He made his decision to respond and turned his eyes toward the mission field. His knowledge of mission fields was as yet limited. He knew something of C.H. Spurgeon, the preacher of preachers in London, having translated one of his sermons from German to Latvian. His knowledge of English was, however, limited to a few words. Procuring a dictionary, he looked up the words he needed and wrote to this Spurgeon. Another letter he sent in the same mail to his parents in Tukum, intimating to them his decision to go on the mission field. Send a message to his parents. A reply came from London, the Bible school. Come. There was also a reply from his parents. Taking, he took the letter to a nearby cemetery whereby it was his custom to eat his noonday lunch and to meditate. And he sat down near a tombstone and hesitatingly read his mother's letter. This is his mother's letter. Dear Basil, he was still the little boy to his mother, even though he had grown to manhood. Dear Basil, Are you going to leave us? Is that all you care for your poor old parents? Don't you love us anymore? Please don't leave us. Basil, my boy, don't go away. We need you. Now that we are getting old, what are we going to do without you, Basil? Don't go away. That's the letter read. And as he was slowly making out the words, he noticed on the sheet that there were big spots caused by teardrops that had fallen from his mother's eyes as he wrote. For a while, he stood looking in space, rigid as the tombstones around him. His poverty-stricken parents needed his aid. The salary of his father one of the early pioneer preachers of Latvia did not reach $100 a year. And he had a family of eight to keep. 
in his youth, his father had left a much better position in order that he might become a gospel preacher. And now, when his older son was beginning to send his aged parents monthly support from his earnings, he was about to leave them to go away to a far-off land, perhaps never to see them again. When he was just earning some money. You see, all the problems we have, there is nothing new. Basil's mind was wandering to the old home in Tukum. Only one room, a dining room, kitchen, parlor, study, combined in one. Then before his vision loomed, his father, his face buried in his hands, pleading with God for souls, tears streaming from his eyes, while his mother was painfully bending over a wash tub. A great lamp rose in his throat and his eyes filled with tears. For some minutes he sobbed as if his heart would break. Then he engaged in agonizing prayer. For a moment he stood and taking the letter of Jesus from his pocket, he read, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. He read the letter from Jesus. These words were burning in his soul. Parent or God? Should he listen to his mother's appeal or should he obey God? Oh, what a battle. Fiercely the struggle raged within him. His eyes were closed. His face was drawn as he fought his battle. Surely he loved his parents. He would like to make himself responsible for them in their old age. His godly parents deserve his support and gratitude for their parental care. What is the word? And love for him in his childhood. But again, he seemed to see before him as if eliminated the words. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Hey. Whosoever be he of you that forsaketh not all, he cannot be my disciple. His mother's words, don't you love us anymore? Is that what you care for your old poor parents? seemed to stab at the very core of his heart. God knows he cared so much for his parents and the violent struggle was almost crushing him to death. He stood up and went to a newly filled tomb covered with fresh wreaths and flowers and with a large cast iron cross embedded among them at the end of the tomb. In his left hand, he was holding his mother's letter and in his right hand, the letter of Jesus, the New Testament. He fell upon his knees confronting the cast iron cross. Tears were copiously flowing from his eyes as this young 18-year-old candidate in the making was crying to heaven, Lord, thou knowest how much I love my dear father and mother and how much I want to stand by them and help them for they gave me earthly life. But, O oh Lord, I love thee more for thou gavest thy life for me on the cruel cross. Save me from making a wrong choice at this critical moment. Help me to choose and to do thy will and thy will alone. Finally, the victory was won. Tears flowing freely while his whole body shook with sobs. When slowly his left hand with his mother's letter went down and his right hand with the New Testament was lifted up high towards heaven. The decision was reached in his heart and the light of his guiding presence filled his soul. As gently his morning was changed to comfort and he began to sing, Nearer my God to thee nearer to thee even though it be a cross that raiseth me is that a song like that you know how to sing it yes even though it be a cross that raiseth me my song shall be nearer my god to thee Nearer, my God, to thee, nearer to thee. Hey. Oh, cross of Christ, I embrace thee, he cried. This is how Basil Maloff was guided, and thus God will guide you if you are willing to be led. For you also may know his will. You too may hear his call. Hallelujah. Sit down. What do you think? It's powerful, isn't it?
You want more? Are you sure you want more? Okay. Missionary preparation. I finished missionary call. I'm going to missionary preparation. There are two kinds of volunteers. Passive and active. (laughs) The passive volunteer says, Lord, here am I. Next year, he says it again. And five years later, he is saying it once more. Lord, I am still here. I tell you, there are two types of volunteers. One of them says, Lord, here I am. Next year, he says it again. Lord, here am I. Five years later, he is saying once more, Lord, I am still here. Here he is, here he was, and here he always will be. He has an idea that he has to wait until he hears a supernatural voice or until God reaches down, picks him up, and transplants him to some foreign land. God cannot use passive volunteers. I tell you, <laughs> the active volunteer we are talking about passive volunteers and active volunteers the active volunteer says Lord here am I send me he puts a goal into his volunteering and sets his face like flint he prays through hindrances and overcomes obstacles by faith he opens closed doors prays in or earns the money he needs for his training and gets his preparation. Finally, he finds himself ready for his life's work. Then he applies to a mission board. And if he is turned down, if he is turned down, eh, then he applies to another. (laughs) Yeah, he applies. At last, he is accepted. Then he prays in his outfit and passage money. And finally, after overcoming every obstacle, he reaches the field. Nothing is allowed to stand in his way. God can use active volunteers. Give the Lord a shout of praise. How may he know the will of God? can he be sure of the of his call he will pray and as he prays if he is not called the burden will lift and he will be at rest but if he is called the burden will get heavier and heavier until like jeremiah he will feel as it were a fire burning in his bones and he will say i cannot contain the fire urge will be upon him and he will have to go satan will do everything in his power to hinder if he can and he often does He will bring him in contact with a young woman who has no intention of being a missionary. I saw that I said, oh, I will just come and read because I don't have anything to add. I don't have anything constructive to add to what I'm, I'm reading.
Satan will do everything in his power to hinder. If he can, and he often does, he will bring him in contact with a young woman who has no intention of being a missionary or vice versa. Many a young woman who is called of God never gets to the mission field simply because she marries a man who is going to remain at home. And thus, and thus her life is wrecked. She gets out of God's will and Satan wins. Yeah. Many young women who are called, that's the end of their ministry. Marry a man and then that's the end of the call. Others will be kept at home by unwilling parents. Parents are to be obeyed, but only in the Lord. God comes first. Some children have been disinherited because they have gone. Spiritual parents will not stand in the way. Satan must not be allowed to hinder. Then, there is the question of health. If Satan can keep the candidate in ill health, he will have gained his purpose. It is up to the prospective missionary to see that proper exercise is taken so as to be physically fit for the field. (laughs) Cases have been known of workers who have been turned down by doctors who have through exercise and care conquered every infirmity and then have been able to serve for many years. The missionary must be in the best of health. Preparation for the foreign field should commence by a study of the biographies of the great pioneers of missionary work. Those who expect to labor in other lands should know as much as they can about those who have gone before. And the best way is by securing the biographies of noted missionaries who laid the foundations. If you, my friend, expect to go, I would suggest that you get the life of David Livingston of Africa and read it until the inspiration of his heroic achievements grips you, stirs you, and moves you to emulate his devotion and consecration. Then, read the life story of Robert Moffat, his father-in-law, who spent 50 years in Africa with but one fellow. Fellow means the time they come back home. Follow these with Alexander Mackay of Uganda. Nor should Mary Slezer of Africa be forgotten. Those of you who went to Achimota School, Slezer House, named after this woman, Mary Slezer. This will give you the knowledge you need of Africa. Turning to China, study the life of J. Hudson Taylor, founder of the China Inland Mission, especially a retrospect. And of course, Robert Morrison, the pioneer of Chinese missions. For a vision of India, read William Carey, the father of modern missions, and Alexander Duff. And then, Henry Martin of Persia, Adoniram Judson of Burma, and James Gilmore of Mongolia should be obtained and studied. And of course, John G. Patton of the New Hebrides, and James Chalmer of New Guinea, and John Williams of the South Sea Islands, and Samuel Marsden of New Zealand. All these. Be sure to read The Splendor of God by Morrow, it is a masterpiece. And then to A Thousand Miles of Miracles by Glover. And for your devotional life, may I suggest David Brenner, The Man of Prayer by Smith, a book I turn to again and again for inspiration and blessing. Most of the so-called faith missions, to distinguish them from denominational boards, require you to have completed your high school education and to have successfully graduated from an accredited Bible institute. If you are young enough, you should take your college work as well, majoring in the Bible. Better still, if you can, graduate from a sound spiritual seminary. To get too much training is impossible, provided you do not lose your vision. But much depends on your age. You should plan to leave for the field by the time you are 25. If at all possible. (laughs) In any case, 
not later than 28. Hence, if you are near the age limit, get your Bible training and be off, even if you are not a high school graduate. During the days of your preparation, learn to cooperate and work with others. All cannot be leaders. Be willing to come under the control of those in authority. Bow to the wisdom of experienced workers. All through your training, you should be actively associated with some missionary church for the day will come when you will need the recommendation of a pastor who knows you well and the backing of a spiritual church. Boss depend to a large extent on what the pastor has to say. In addition to education, you need some practical experience. For if God cannot use you at home, neither can he use you on the foreign field. <laughs> If he cannot use you at home, neither can he use you on the phone field. Some kind of Christian service is absolutely essential. Do personal work, preach, take meetings, help in rescue missions, visit the sick, learn to sacrifice, rough it, live by faith. Get all the practical experience you can. In other words, be a soul winner at home before you go to a foreign field. There is nothing in the crossing of the ocean that will make you a missionary. There is nothing in the crossing of an ocean that will make you a missionary. There is nothing in the crossing of an ocean that will make you a missionary. Unless you are successful before you leave, you will not be successful after. If you can secure an elementary knowledge of bookkeeping, that's accounting and typewriting, it will be invaluable. That means it will be valuable. Many missionaries lack business training and it is important that accounts should be kept accurately. If you are young enough and you have everything else you need, you should take a year in medicine. Yeah. Such a course is considered necessary by most missions working in tropical regions. You will then know how to take care of yourself when you are sick and other missionaries and Christians as well. Besides relieving minor ailments among the natives and thus making an opening for the gospel. Language study is always a problem. If therefore you can take an intensive course in phonetics and phonemics, you will find it a real time saver. When you are ready, apply to one of the mission boards carrying on work in the country to which you believe God has called you. If you write to them, they will be glad to send you their literature. And when you have completed your training, application forms. I would suggest that you keep in touch with the mission under which you are expected to serve from beginning. Study their literature and learn as much as you can about the work. In going to the field, you should go under a board that is prepared to accept financial responsibility. I believe in faith, but faith on behalf of the board as well as the worker. The missionary has enough to contend with and it is up to the board that sends to see that money comes in so that full allowance can be paid and all emergency needs can be met. Whatever you do, go under a well-accredited mission. Do not go under an inexperienced board. You will find an approved mission in almost every field. If the society to which you apply belongs to the Interdenominational Foreign Mission Association of North America, it is safe. <laughs> hey, there are still vast territories where the gospel has never been preached. You may yet be a pioneer. If God has called you, do not hesitate to go. No greater honor can come to any man or woman than the honor of being a missionary. You will be the Lord's ambassador. Be faithful and the crown of life will be yours. And when at last the home call comes, you will say with the sainted Bernard, I would not have spent my life otherwise for the whole world. Amen. Now, missionary hardships.
Missionary work today is very different from what it was 50 years ago. And yet there are still pioneer fields where heroism is demanded and persecution rages. Trails there are that have never been blazed, where suffering is the lot of those who venture. I want to remind the committee, said Mackay of Uganda. This is the missionary who was about to leave. He said, I want to remind the committee. I want to remind the committee. He said, I want to remind the committee, as he was, as he was, as he was leaving to Uganda, he said that within six months, they will hear that probably hear that one of us is dead. One of us, at least, it may be I, will surely fall before that. But what I want to say is this. When the news comes, do not be cast down. But send somebody else immediately to fill the vacant place. When you hear that one of us is dead, immediately send somebody. That prediction was literally fulfilled. One by one, the members of Marquis's party died either of fever or were murdered by the natives. Until before long, he was alone left. Why let the hardships deter? Listen to what David Brenner said. He said, here am I, Lord. Send me to the ends of the earth. Send me to the rough, the savage pagans of the wilderness. Send me from all that is called comfort in this earth. Or earthly comfort, send me to death itself. If it be but in thy service and to promote thy kingdom. Send me. Send me to death if it is in thy service and to promote thy kingdom. Then listen to Francis Xavier. When I went to Asim Fosu, I saw a St. Francis Xavier Hospital at Asim Fosu. This is what he said, this man, Francis Xavier. He said, yet more, oh my God, more toil, more agony, more suffering for thee. Hear what C.T. Stad said. If Jesus Christ be God and died for me, then no sacrifice can be too great for me to make for him. Even death itself can be glorious. David Livingston said, death is a glorious event to one going to Jesus. Strange it would be if you read the life of Kari of India and keep back the tears. Even the directors of the East India Company, the father of all missions, he was opposed. Listen to the resolution that they wrote before he left. He said, the sending out of missionaries into our Eastern possessions is the maddest, most extravagant, most costly, most indefensible project that has ever been suggested by a moonstruck fanatic. Somebody who has been struck by the moon. You must be struck by the moon to suggest that we should go as missionary. Such a scheme is pernicious, imprudent, useless, harmful, dangerous, profitless, and fantastic. To send out a missionary. People were opposed to it. It strikes against all reason and sound policy. And it brings the peace and safety of our possessions into peril. It may be of interest to know that in 1796, the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland passed the following resolution. They said, to spread the knowledge of the gospel amongst barbarous and heathen nations seems to be highly preposterous. You see, in 1796, people were opposed to send, sending the gospel. One speaker in the House of Commons said, I would rather see a band of devils let loose in India than a band of missionaries. People were opposed to missionary work. Such was the opposition to missions when Carey set forth. And yet in the midst of his deepest trials, his heart breaking, he was able to write as follows. Why is my soul disquieted? Things may turn out better than I expect. Everything is known to God. In Carey's day, the, the, the theologians believed that the gospel, sent the gospel to every creature, was meant for the apostles only. Finally, when he, he did go, he was burdened with two unsympathetic women, his wife and her sister, four helpless children, and a colleague who was an eccentric and hopelessly in debt. Mercy. Hey. In addition, he was completely misunderstood by the society that sent him out, slandered by his enemies, and persecuted by the natives he had come to win. Did ever a man face the task of world evangelism under more unfavorable circumstances? Yet he stood the test and became the father of modern missions. Amen. Are you there? 
Yeah. So I'm going to end here. And, um, but I'll read what I read, I believe, on Friday. Some missionaries who were lying on the beach, dying. He said, as they were dying, six of them, because their boat had been stranded. Listen to what they said. He said, should anything prevent me ever adding to this, let all my beloved ones at home rest assured I was happy beyond expression. Beyond all expression, the night I wrote these lines, I would not have changed my situation with any man living. Let them also be assured that my hopes were full and blooming with immortality. And the hope of glory, the hope laid out for me in heaven, filled my whole heart with joy and gladness. And that to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. That I can say, I am in a strait betwixt two, to abide in the body or to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. And then his assistant sailor, he wrote this. He says, with him died the sailor saint, Captain Alan Gardiner. Slowly he starved to death. A little rice, this is what he had. Two cakes of chocolate. Six mice, one pound of salt pork was all there was to sustain the lives of himself and his heroic companions. <laughs> Six mice, salted pork, small rice, two boxes of chocolate, and what? Yeah, was all there was left. And yet this was the way he faced it. He said, my prayer is that the Lord my God may be glorified in me, whatever it may be in life or in death. That he will, should we fall, vouchsafe to raise up and send forth other laborers into this harvest, that his name be magnified. You see, it sounds a bit like Al-Qaeda type of people. Like if I die, let another one come. Yeah. You see, that, that's how Christianity took the world. And today, the spirit of sacrifice is gone. And has been planted into Muslims as we try to become more prosperous and more whatever, preserve ourselves more. Six mice, salted pork. (laughs) That his kingdom, he should send forth other laborers, that his name be glorified, his kingdom enlarged, and that in the salvation of multitudes from among the inhabitants, from the pagan land. As he neared the end, he wrote, Blessed be my heavenly father for the many mercies I enjoy. A comfortable bed. No pain or even cravings of hunger. Though excessively weak and scarcely able to turn in my bed, at least it is a very great exertion. But I am, by his abounding grace, kept in perfect peace, refreshed with a sense of my Savior's love. And an assurance that all is wisely and mercifully appointed. Finally, on a lonely, hostile Patagonia, the last survivor of these six missionaries, he died. And thus the scene is pictured by Jesse Page. He said, all was still now on that shore. And in the side, this is the person who discovered them. In the sight of the sky and the sea, the unburied matters lay. No slow, painful footsteps on the shingle now. No reverent words of praise whispered by the faint breath of dying men. God had sent his messenger to stay the sufferings of the saints. And they rested in peace. So he giveth his beloved sleep. At last they were found and a service was held. Yes, indeed. Alan Gardner and his brave companions had caught the vision. Not a combat, not even one combat did they win. Alone they suffered, their wives, loved ones, and families far away. Help came too late, yet they gladly gave their lives for the savage Indians of dark, benighted Patagonia. You know Patagonia. It's a place. But did they die in vain? No. The blood of the martyrs soon became the seed of the church and a glorious harvest followed. Someone had to pioneer and Gardner answered the call. Can we do less? So, that's it. Missionary call, missionary preparation, and missionary hardships. Stand to your feet. Let's pray.
Let us lift our hands and ask God that the church will be restored to its glory. Father, we pray for the spirit of the missionary and the spirit of sacrifice to serve you will be restored to the lives, the hearts of your church. We thank you for this great privilege that you give us today. Oh, Father, thank you for a renewal in our hearts of your perfect will that we may serve you and we may do your perfect will in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. We, we love you, Lord. We praise you, Father. We, we give you glory. We give you thanks. We, we honor you. We love you. We praise you. In the name of him who died on the cross, gave himself for We thank you, Lord, for your great blessing in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. As every head is bowed and every eye closed, if you are here tonight, you are not a born again Christian, you want to say, Pastor, pray with me. I want to give my life to, to God. I want to give my life to Jesus Christ. If you are here like that, wherever you are standing, just lift up your right hand and I'm going to pray with you. I'm going to pray with you. Lift it up high. God bless you. Lift it up high. Pastor, pray with me. I want Jesus to come into my life to save me. I want to be a new person. Lift it up high. God bless you. God bless you. High up in the sky so I can see. Thank you. If you've lifted your hand, come to me in the front. Come to me quickly, 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 quickly. I want to pray with you. God bless you. what is true what is eternal what is real what your will holds for us may, may we not be denied the opportunity to live for you O oh God to serve you to go everywhere you want us to go Lord to do what you want us to do 
I thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Give the Lord a mighty clap offering and you may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I want you to take out your offering before I make a few remarks about what I've just read. Take out your special offering for tonight. Healing Jesus Crusade Offering. Amen. God is going to bless you. Going to bless you powerfully. So take out something. Don't make yourself the poverty chairman of any church. Never, never, never accept that position. The poverty chairman is the one in charge of all poor people. We who don't give offerings. We who never have money. We who don't have, no. Refuse it. Tell somebody, I refuse that position. I will not be the poverty chairman of this church. Amen. How many realize that if people are determined like these guys, there is no place that cannot be conquered. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Today, anywhere that is a little far, a little hard, or a little poor is dominated by Muslims. It's a trend. You know, today I was talking to one brother who was, uh, he's, 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 past, he's gone to Ketekrachi, which is at the northern part of the Volta Lake, up at the top. And he said to me, oh, it's, it's a lot of Islam. And it just struck me that once the place is far and it's north and it's out of reach of anywhere wealthy, successful, whatever, Islam will have taken over that place. Because we have busied ourselves with prosperity and wealth creation. Wealth creation is not the gospel. No matter whose big church preaching about that. It's not the gospel. Can never has never been the gospel. It's a fallacy. It's, a, it's, a, it's false. Money is part of our preaching. It's part of the things that we believe in. That God blesses and God makes us rich. But the gospel is not about money. Cannot be the main thing. It has never been. And will never be. No matter who is saying it. And how big his church is. Do you understand? Yeah. So, the real gospel has to do with Jesus Christ and what Jesus said. And, and unless that truth is within us, we are going to be powerless. So please, don't shy away from the real strength and power that comes from following what God says. Amen. Amen. Lift your offering up with your right hand. Father, Thank you for this offering that we present to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Take out a booster that is in addition to whatever you took. You forgot about the booster, but I am reminding you that we want also a booster or an additional offering. Do you understand? Because last week we didn't have. God willing, next week we are going to continue with Oswald J. Sanders. When, when I read, you see, I'm happy I'm reading what he's saying. You know, I just sit back and then he says, no, I'm not the one saying all these things. But you realize that the things that he's saying, we have been saying them. So today I've got somebody to speak for me. I felt so safe behind the book. It's like it's not me. Somebody else is saying it. Lift your offering with your right hand and your booster with your left hand. And let's pray. Father, thank you for this blessed offering that we give today in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord. Amen. Ashes, I'll receive the offering. I'll receive it. Amen. You know, the part of, of this thing that struck me is what the atheist said. That if it is true that there is a better life over there, then I would give my whole life to religion. It's true. And, and it's, that's why I asked Dr. Go one day do you, do you value your salvation? Yeah. Do you realize what has happened to you? You see, one day I was in Takurade with him. And we were sitting outside a disco at about 2 a.m., 3 a.m. But we had had a crusade and we had finished. So we had gone there and a garden. But the garden was next to a disco. And when we came, we were going to the car. The discotheque door opened. And there came out a man with some chains on his hand. And wild looking guy, 3 a.m. 
And Dr. Go said, this dog, he used to come out of here. At what time in the, in the morning? 4 a.m. You move into the final call at that time. <laughs> ah. So my question is that, just as this wild man probably smoked weed, drank, whatever bad things he's planning on doing, what, are they, what else are they doing apart from exercising all forms of bodily lusts and desires? And, such, and you, you used to come out of such a door. Now Christ has saved you. And you are standing on a platform preaching. What must you do with the rest of your life? So as he was giving his life for other causes, that's why I asked him that, do you understand what salvation is? Does it mean much? And I told him, I said, I remember I was in Cape Coast with him. I said, to me, your salvation doesn't, do you remember? Your salvation doesn't mean much to you. I told him, I said, to me, your, I, I don't think you know what, what it means to be saved. Yeah. Yeah. And to me, I said, to me, you don't value your salvation. That's what I feel. Because it's very hard to be saved. Think of how you are here now. It looks natural, but it's very hard to be here. Very, very hard. If this is what salvation is, then to me, it's worth giving my whole life for salvation of as many people as possible. Amen. And I pray that on the day that I go up in fire or whatever method, I'll preach unto that day and serve him to that very day. Yeah. And never alter what I'm saying. And now that's why that's why these days the books that I buy, they are no, they are no, the modern books. I don't. I stopped going to bookshops because these ones you cannot find them. This one, I'm reading. I want to read such books. If you read other chapter, the why and how of foreign missions, it, it, the, the chapters are there. Yeah, the why and how of foreign missions. Huh? The shadow of the cross. A worldwide vision. And what? The missionary program. The great words of Christian experience. Come and read it. Come here. I can't see. What is this? The poison of modernism. Poison. He has about 17 points on the poison of modern, modern things. Modernism. Modern, like, what is this? It's a modern cow. It's a modern dress. A poison of modernism. The story of my hymns. Married to another. Talk about, that chapter is called Marriage to Christ. The first chapter, we are married to Christ. <laughs> the, shot, the Christ, the Christ of John's gospel. The story of my early life. Yeah. And at the end, the book come and read it he just put a he finished the book here the end you see the end and then he just wrote some small sentences read the sentence <laughs> why should anyone hear the gospel twice before everyone has heard it once Oswald J. Smith why should anyone hear the gospel twice when everyone has heard it once? No, everyone has not heard. Where everyone has heard it. Yes. Why should anyone hear the gospel twice before, before everyone has heard it once? Also, this one is also J. Smith. Why should you hear it twice when people have not heard it once? Amen. Amen. So it, it, it will be our blessing 
We don't know how God will do it. But I believe. Those of you who are missionaries, go in. You see, these are the words that should encourage you. It's nothing new. It's nothing you. You have to, you have to survive. You see, preparation. Your health. And what? One year in medicine. <laughs> Account. Huh? Typewriting. Bookkeeping. Reading the biographies. Learning the language. Phonetics. Yeah. David Livingston. Read. People were dying on the beat. Six of them. They were writing every day. We are left with six mice. We are left with salted pork. We are left with rice. We are left with chocolate. Small rice. They were eating mice. They were left. This was their for six mice, salted pork, rice, and chocolate. <laughs> and they died. They were saying that, oh, glory be to God. We are not feeling any pain. We are not feeling any pain as we are dying. We are not feeling. We thank you, oh God. We give you glory. But there's no pain in our death. Wow. Instead of the chronically dissatisfied Christian who cannot be satisfied by anything that he is given. We are never satisfied with anything that we have. We are in the church always complaining, complaining about our husband, complaining about our wife, complaining about our life, complaining about money, complaining. Chronically dissatisfied people. Chronically dissatisfied. Never happy. Hey. Never grateful for anything. <laughs> it, there, there's a saying that if you see a river flowing upwards, it means somebody is being grateful. Yeah? If you see a river flowing upwards, normally rivers flow down. If you see a river flowing upwards, it means somebody is being grateful. Yeah? We are not happy with anything. We want. We want everything that we don't have. Anything that God hasn't given us is our desire. We are just like Adam, who had 10,000 thousand trees and was left with one tree. So, no, these trees, I, I want this one that I don't have. So, friends and countrymen, let's serve the Lord with passion. Let's give our, ourselves for a worthy, worthy cause. Let's do his will. Yes. That's why I felt so happy, you know. I felt like I had a shield in front of me. Because you know, sometimes when you preach about certain things, at the point you feel that like you are some way. You know, can't you see that you are some way? As we are preaching, can't you see that you are some way? Those thoughts come to one's mind. Nabi, I do remember. I asked her, she was in America. One day she came to Ghana. I said, Those of you in America, how do you see me? She said, Oh, sometimes I said, in those days. So sometimes when I come around, it's like too much healing Jesus. It's like, yeah, there are souls to be one. So, but I mean it's a bit too much. So, but too much. Yeah. You see, all the things I'm saying, they are in people's minds. You think I'm just saying something, but it's in people's minds. Yeah. It's like it's a bit too much. I mean, why? Is it like a, that's why I said, if something were to happen to us as we are going for healing Jesus, you will see Christians, not um, unbelievers who feel sorry for us, but Christians, they will say, ah, this man, Mr. Just, he feels that he can do this, he can do. Why? 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 That's, that's how Christians, I know Christians. I let God touch your heart. These things are true. Too true sometimes. They are real. But God will bless you greatly. For me, serving God has not been, it's not been easy, but it's worth it. It's been worth it. Just having the Lord. Just have, even if there's no heaven. Even if there's no heaven. It's been worth it serving him and following him you may ask me why i serve the lord 
Is it just for heaven's gain? Or to walk those mighty streets of gold And to hear the angels sing? And is it just to drink from that fountain? That never shall run dry Or just to live forever Live forever and ever In that sweet old by and by But if heaven never was promised to me promise to live eternally it's been worth just having the Lord in my life I was living in a world of darkness he came along and brought me the light for I was living in a world of darkness he came along and brought me the light and if heaven never if it still heaven, was promised to me, neither God's promise to live eternally. It's been worth just having the Lord in my life. You know I was living in a world of darkness came along and brought me the light. We all were living in a world of darkness. He came and brought us the light. Oh, if there were never any streets of gold, neither a land where we will never grow. Just having the Lord in my life For I was living in a world of darkness Came along and brought me the light I was living in a world of darkness He came and brought me the light We all were living in a world of darkness He came and brought us the light Without Christ, where do we stand? What is your life? What, what, what are you doing here? What are you going to achieve? What are you going to get? You see, if you think a little bit extra, you will realize that there is no other purpose in this world than to serve God. That's why Solomon himself concluded that the conclusion of this whole matter is to fear God and to keep his commandments. Because your life amounts to nothing in the end. It's true. It's been worth having the law. It's been worth following the law. And I want to follow him. Even if there's a fire ahead, I want to follow him into the fire. How many would like to follow if the Lord is in the fire? How many would like to follow him into that fire? Do you like to be in the fire where the Lord is? I would like to be there. Even if there is a fire there, I would like to follow to that fire. I don't like water. I like the fire. It's worth, it's worth it. I will always encourage you to work for God. When I don't encourage you to work for God, that's when I'm lying. I will always encourage you to work. If I'm telling you the truth from my heart, I will, you see that I'm encouraging you to work for God. When I don't encourage you to work for God, either I've decided to keep quiet or I'm lying. Like Elijah told Elisha, don't follow me. It will be that kind of commandment. But when I'm telling you the truth from my heart, I 
will always encourage you. One day I got a group of people. I said, I'm going to pray for you my best prayer. It is in a camp. I don't know if it was recorded. Is it on it? I prayed. Huh, my best prayer. I prayed. I said, God grant you the opportunity to work for him. He's the best. And the highest. I will not change it. I will not reverse it. Yeah. No matter how many difficulties we go through, serving the Lord. You know, during this year's homecoming, I was standing there and I was looking at the people testifying, you know, and you look and you say, wow, it's worth it. You know, I wanted to do more. More. So then I went to home. I preached in a church, big like this, full of people. I said, hey, it's worth it. Do more, more. I felt like, build. I said, after I was talking with my secretary, I said, let's build 100 churches here. I said, let me join hands with you and believe God. we are going to build 100 churches in the Volta region only. We we'll build 100 churches. God will help us. 100 buildings, buildings. The ones which have buildings, we can build. It's possible. Yeah, it's possible. You want to fight with me? I won't fight with you. I'm going to fight doing the work of God. I'm going to hide from your hatred and work for him. Yeah. I'll hide from your despisement and work for him. I'll cover myself from your despisement and from your looking down on me, from what I believe. And I'll work for my Savior, whom I love. And I'll work with the, the discounted people whom you have discounted. I'll work with them who, who love him and who want to serve him and who believe that he's worth living for and dying for. The people that you have discounted and ruled out and ruled out as unqualified, I'll work with them and serve him. It's true. Call me whatever name you want. When I was in school, I've been called every name. A guy met me and said, you think you go to heaven by being a skeleton? The next time I heard of him, he was a multiple fornicator. You think you go to heaven by being a skeleton? People have been making fun of me for years. If I had not met Christ in secondary school, I would hate my secondary school with all my heart. But I met him there. And in the church. Is he powerful? Who oh, that? Who is that? I'm going to hold closely the people who believe in it. You get it? You get it? You get it? You get it? I'm going to hold them close. I'm going to work. I'm determined. To the end. I will die serving him. In the name of Jesus. Yeah. I will die serving him. Yeah. There's no retirement in my job. I don't care what you think. You may consider me to be a fanatic. That's why I preach in the evenings. And I've left normal people to be in the mornings. Yeah. You get it? You get it? I don't care. But comments, I don't care what you think about me. I don't care. Okay? I don't care. I don't care. The songs that I sing, I don't care if you know them or not. I don't care if you know them. If they are part of the songs that you, you have in your collection. These are the songs that I have. Uh, yeah, and I'm going to sing them. Somebody said, when Ida is singing a song, it means that it's from the 70s. I will continue to sing from the 70s and from the 80s. I will sing it. And the 60s. <laughs> and I'm going, this book is 1946. This book is 1946. 
the old wine is better than the new wine. And when you have tasted the old wine, you will say, you will not look for the new wine again when you have tasted the old wine. You will say that the old wine is better when you have tasted the old wine. Continue to think of me as somebody who has, who is not walking on the on the level, the level something is tipping. Continue to think that way. I will continue to be tipping to the side. It's true. That's why I told Doctor Go that you don't appreciate your salvation. That's why I told him that. Because to me, I've, I've, I've seen a Christian who doesn't appreciate what it means to be saved. Yeah. And it changed him. It changed him. Because if, if religion, according to an atheist, is, it changes your life in the future, then he said, if I believe in it, I will give everything to, to religion. Yeah. <laughs> For me to live is Christ. What shall it profit a man? You say I'm wasting your time in the evening. I'm wasting your time. I'm wasting your time. I'm wasting your time. That's why I told you to come in the morning. <laughs> so I'm wasting your time. Yeah. So listen, my friend, my brother. God's word is the same. It will not change. Even if it, if it doesn't work for you, or it doesn't work for me, it's still true. Even if you are sick and you don't get healed, doesn't mean that the word of God is true. It is true. I am not the confirmation of the word of God. And my life is not the confirmation. You two are not the confirmation. The word of God is there. And you two are there. You get it? My success does not, or failure does not change the word of God. It's there. Yeah. <coughs> Amen. That's why I, I, I borrowed Oswald J. Sanders to speak for me this evening. And I stood back. He himself said it. He said, many a young man, their ministry is poor. Because they go and marry a woman, a young woman who has no intentions of becoming a missionary. And he said, and Satan gets the upper hand. Yeah. He prefers to stay at home. Hey. Anyway, sing something quickly. I can keep it to myself. I've got to go out and tell somebody I can't keep it to myself Cause somebody's lost, somebody's dying I can't keep it to myself I've got to tell somebody else For they've got to know That Jesus loves them so don't keep it to yourself you need to go out and tell somebody don't keep it to yourself cause somebody's lost somebody's dying don't keep it to yourself you need to tell somebody else for they've got to know that Jesus loves Cause they don't even know there's a God who is willing to help them dead alone. They don't know, they don't know. that he can see them through the darkest night. How will, How will they, know? they find out there's a God above he really understands. He can heal broken hearts 
If they just give him a chance I must go, we must go and let them know Are we gonna let them know? I can't keep it to myself I've gotta go out and tell somebody I can't keep it to myself Cause somebody's lost, somebody's dying I've got to tell somebody else for they've got to know Jesus loves them so please don't keep it to yourself you need to go out and tell somebody please don't keep it to yourself cause somebody's lost and somebody's dying don't bless you. Sit down. Wow. You know, you don't really understand why God does certain things. Now, as I just put on my phone here, I just got a text that our Pastor Billy Joe Doty, he, he died today. Yeah. And I just marvel. I say, wow. You know? You just wonder. Yeah. It's like when God just come home. It's very marvelous but that is why we must serve him with all strength without reducing the level of acceleration do you understand yeah God is mysterious. Sometimes you see people who are causing trouble. They never die. They never even get sick. They never even get sick. And people that are good or we see as good, doing good things. I can't even believe it. So, let's serve him. Because everything... In just a, I was in Korea, but I was just in, entering Korea when I heard the news that he was not well. Just three weeks. You, you were, were, were you, you were, yeah. How many weeks? Just a few weeks. Can't even believe it. So, brothers and sisters, I think life is such that, you know, you ask yourself, even chickens will know that they will die by Christmas. Isn't it? Because when they look among themselves, they don't see anybody who is more than three months. <laughs> Do you get it? There's nobody here more than three months. <laughs> Although they could live longer, but there's nobody in that whole section who is more than three. Even they have a kind of prediction. It takes away the certainty that Sometimes you see people planning. Okay, I'm going to do this. Okay, I'll do this. Okay, next time then, okay, we'll meet here, we'll do this. So young ones, they said by 25 you should be gone. And at the latest, 28. (laughs) Wow. May we fill Guinea 
Guinea-Bissau, Senegal, Liberia, Sierra Leone, Mali, Niger, Nigeria, Benin, Togo, Mauritania, Congo, Brazzaville, Congo, Ethiopia, Kenya, Zambia, Congo, Brazzaville, Somalia, Eritrea, Sudan, Chad, uh, uh, Uganda, Zambia, Lesotho, South Africa, Zimbabwe, eh? Botswana, Malawi. Countries are waiting. Nations are waiting eh, for you to go and do his will. If you appreciate your salvation, may you be one of those that help us to go there. In Jesus' name. God bless you and forgive me for wasting your time if I've wasted your time, please. Please uh, stand to your stand to your feet and let's share the grace. Hold somebody's hand and share the grace, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, communion, fellowship, contribution, participation of the Holy Ghost, now and forevermore. Amen. God bless you.